I want to start off this morning just by praying and asking God to speak to us. I, I really believe the Holy Spirit wants to minister you in a, a special way. And so I want you to specifically pray that. I want you to pray that the Lord would speak to you and he would open your heart for you to receive from him today. Will you join me in praying that right now in the name of Jesus? Father, thank you so much for your word that you have given to us. We know that your word is perfect. It is for us today. And I'm praying, Lord Jesus, right now that each of us, Lord, we would just be open to receive from you, that we would hear from you, hear from your word in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray everybody say amen. 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 So we're going through the book of Luke, and one of the things we've discovered is that Jesus Christ has like really been impacted by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary at his birth. The Holy Spirit came down on him at baptism. The Holy Spirit drove him to the wilderness. And then the Holy Spirit was on him to begin teaching. And so with that thought in mind, I want you to see what happens in Luke chapter 4. There are six verses I want to read to you. And it's packed full of some pretty cool stuff that you can like skim over if you're not careful and dig down into it. But Luke chapter 4 verse 31 says, Then Jesus went to Capernaum. So he had been in Nazareth where his hometown, but he left there because they didn't really want to hear what he was saying. And so he goes to a town in Galilee and he teaches in this synagogue, which was a gathering place, every Sabbath day. And there also, as in other places, the people were amazed at his teaching, for he spoke with authority. Now, that word authority there is going to loom large in this passage. And so think about in terms of the authority of the word of God. And so he's teaching with authority. And, and one day when he's in the house, the synagogue teaching... There's this man who comes possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. Now, there's a couple things here I want you to see. The first of which is that um, this guy decides to come to the synagogue, and he's demon-possessed. Now, I, I'm guessing that he wanted to come because he'd heard about Jesus. He'd heard about Jesus' teaching. He'd heard that Jesus was unique, that he was doing things that other people weren't doing. And so there's a desire in him to come and see Jesus. But I'm also guessing that the demon didn't want to go. I'm just going to assume that the demon doesn't want to go to the house of God. And so what I want you to see right there is this, that if you want to get to God, the devil and all of his legions of armies cannot stop you from getting to God. All of hell cannot stop you from getting to God. And you need to know that. You need to know that God loves you enough that he's not going to allow the enemy to stop you from getting to him. And so this demon cannot stop this man from coming to hear Jesus this day. That's so cool to me. And, and, I, and I love that because I don't ever want to think that the enemy has enough power to keep God from doing what he wants to do in my life. God wants to do great things in your life and the devil cannot stop him. And so this man comes. He, he's demon possessed. Now, I wonder at this point if anybody else knew that this demon was there. Like, did he just come to the synagogue and take a seat up, you know, uh, next to somebody, and that person just thinks it's another person in the synagogue that day? They don't know that they're sitting next to a demon. It kind of makes me wonder who you're sitting next to today. Like, are you sitting next to somebody that might have a little bit of an evil spirit on them? But here's what's true, though, is it was an evil spirit in the house of God. And even though this evil spirit was there, there's something that happens, and, and this, is important. this is important for you to see, because sometimes I think we get things out of order. Like we really have a lot of confidence in Satan, but we don't have a whole lot of confidence in God. We do that because we get scared about what might happen, but we don't always have faith for what God can do. And, and we get things backwards, but I want you to see this, because when this evil spirit comes, it cries out. And began shouting at Jesus, go away. Why are you interfering with us? Jesus of Nazareth, we, ha have you come to destroy us? So it's not just one demon. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And so this demon proclaims a truth that so many of us don't proclaim. We don't acknowledge who he really is in our lives. But he, he, cli he cries this out and he asks the question, why are you interfering with us? Why are you messing with us? And so if you look at the passage as a whole and you ask the question, okay, what was Jesus doing? 
to interfere with the demons? What was he doing that was messing with them? What was he doing that caused them fear? And the answer is he was only doing one thing, just one thing, and that was teaching the Word of God. That's what he was doing. He was teaching the Word of God, but he was teaching it differently than anyone else had ever taught it before And that's going to be so critical to this message today. And you'll see that in just a few moments. And so Jesus looks at him and says, looks at the person and says, be quiet. Come out of the man. He orders the demon to come out. And at that, the demon threw the man on the floor, just threw him to the ground. And so now the next time your child gets upset at you and they throw a temper tantrum and they throw themselves to the ground, you have a reference point for what's happening. And as the crowd watched, And it it came out of him. It didn't hurt the man any further. And and so this demon responds to the words of Jesus. And so Jesus has this authority again. Verse 36, amazed, the people exclaimed, what authority and power this man's words possess. Even evil spirits obey him, and they flee at his command. And so all these people are astounded by this. And it makes me wonder, when they say, wow, this guy has some incredible authority, the demons left when he told them to leave. And it makes me think that they had tried to get the demons to leave before. But they didn't have the authority to tell the demons to leave. And so they couldn't do it. See, there's different types of authority. There's authority at work. There's a boss who has authority. But his authority ends at the business. There there are government authorities. But they only have so much authority within the government. Their authority ends at a certain point. There are authorities in your home. But those authorities end at a certain point. And so there's a limit to it. And I think sometimes we try to do things with authority. That we don't have the right authority to do it. But you can get the right authority to do what needs to be done. And here's where we'll begin. The first thing I want you to see The reason that Jesus was able to tell the demon to leave is because God's word is power. Not God's word has power or God's word has some power, but God's word is power. It's the embodiment of power. Remember what John said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. God doesn't just have power. God is power. God's word is who he is. Therefore, God's word is power power. And so when you think about the word of God and what Jesus was doing, the reason that the demon exposed himself and began to shout at Jesus is because when Jesus was proclaiming the word of God, it revealed something. And this is what happens to you and me. This is why you need to be in your Bible every single day reading the word of God. It's because the Bible will reveal stuff about you. Don't just go to the Bible thinking, I want to see what the Bible says, but go into the Bible thinking, I want the Bible to speak to me because I want the Bible to reveal who I am to myself. There are times when I've read the Bible and I felt convicted because I read something and and it just jumped out at me and it revealed something to me about myself. There's times I've read the Bible and I felt challenged because the Bible just jumps out at you and it speaks to you in a certain way. The Bible has power to reveal things in your life. In this case, it caused the demon to reveal himself. But you need to know that in your life, you, as you study the Word of God and you continue to get into the Word, of God, it's going to show you some things. It'll show you where your attitude isn't right. It'll show you where you're not treating someone correctly. It'll show you that you're doing something you ought not to do. If you want to break the the bonds of sin in your life, get in the Word of God and let the Word of God show you how to get liberty, how to get freedom. That's the power of the Word of God. So God's Word is power. And it comes at us in different ways. The prophet Isaiah speaking on behalf of God, said that the Bible was like rain that would fall down on us. And here's what he says. It's it's, it's like rain. It is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. And so rain comes down. Now, I love rain. I love when rain falls. I I just like what rain does. I like that rain just, just purifies the air. The air always feels so good after a good rainstorm, right? Just feels good. I love rain because I own a house that has a yard that I want to have grass. And so I love that it causes the grass to grow and it causes the the flowers to bloom and the trees to grow. I I love all of that stuff. And and there's just something good about it. I like to sleep during the rain. I I don't know what it is about rain. It just makes me sleep better. 
And so rain comes at us in this soft way. And so you don't think of it in terms of rain as being powerful, but go three or four months without rain. And then you begin to discover the power and the authority of rain. And so God says there's sometimes the word of God is going to come on you like that. And there's a certain power that comes with that. But there's also a different type of power the word of God carries. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. It cuts between the soul and the spirit. You and I can't even begin to discern within ourselves between our soul and our spirit. Like psychologically, that, that, that is just an incredible uh, concept. There's a lot of, uh, of, of, of a philosophy about people asking the question between the soul and spirit and how to discern between the soul and spirit and what is the difference? Are they the same? And yet the word of God is so powerful, it can differentiate between the soul and the spirit, between the joint and the marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and our desires but, but the writer of Hebrews says it's not coming like the rain. It's coming like a two-edged sword that has a sharp point on it that can be thrust in your life and divides your life and separates it. And so the word of God comes with power. The reason Jesus was able to speak to the demon is because he was the embodiment of the word of God. And he was able to tell the demon to leave because the word of God has power. But Jesus knew something that so many other people who have studied the word of God don't know, and that is this, that there is a necessity of faith. You can't just proclaim that, that you understand the Word of God. You have to believe that the Word of God is actually the Word of God, and you have to believe in the authority of the Word of God. You have to believe what it says. You have to believe that Jesus did die on the cross of Calvary. Why? Because you and I are sinners, and without Him we have no hope. You have to believe that part of it. And so when you come to the Word of God, if you don't have faith in what is happening here, then your heart's not going to be open. Faith opens us up to receive the word of God. And we know this is true because Hebrews 4, 2 says, For the good news came to us just as it did to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. There's an element of faith that you and I need to have. Now, we all have different levels of faith. The Bible says to every man is dealt a measure of faith. But some have little faith, some have medium faith, some have a lot of faith. I want a lot of faith. But even if you have just a little bit of faith, if you come to the word of God asking God, God, I want you to speak to me. In fact, every single Sunday when you come to this house, you ought not to come with the idea of, oh, I hope the preacher's got a good message today. Come with this idea instead. God, I want you to speak to me through your word. If you will come with that attitude, even the worst preacher will minister to you. Because instead of him trying to perform for you, you're opening yourself up to God, saying, God, I don't care how you do it. I just want you to deal with me. I want you to change my mind. I want you to change my heart. And, and so, so there has to be this element of faith. So there's a necessity of faith, but then there's also the necessity of the Holy Spirit. And this is why Jesus could do things that they couldn't do. The reason they perceived that he was a man of authority is because he had the Holy Spirit. He said in the previous passage, he said, the, the Spirit is upon me to preach the gospel message, to preach the message to the poor that liberty will come, that blind will see. The Spirit is upon me. You and I need the Holy Spirit. If faith opens us up, it's the Holy Spirit that guides us to make those changes we need to make. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the power. You, you do not have enough willpower to do what needs to be done in your life. You need the Holy Spirit to give you the ability to do it. There's a lot of people who have tried to live good lives just through sheer willpower. They've tried to discipline themselves. And you can to a certain level. But we need the Holy Spirit to take us to a whole other level. And, the, and so there's necessity of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, But people who are not spiritual cannot receive these truths from God's Spirit. It sounds foolish to them, and they cannot understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what it means. And so when you have the Holy Spirit of God in your life, and let me just pause here and say, if you do not have the Holy Spirit of God in your life, the Bible says eight times, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is a gift. All you have to do is ask for it. Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I send the comforter unto you. You can have the Holy Spirit. And when you have the Holy Spirit in your life, you will understand the word of God. I'm, I'm 53 years old. As of yesterday, it was my 53rd birthday. Thank you to all of you who, who celebrated with me. You guys are so kind. 
I, I think I spent the entire day responding to text messages, but I love it. I do. I love it because I felt loved. I thought it was just a, an incredible day. That and I was stuck in the Atlanta airport and didn't have anything else to do. But <laughs> that, well, that part's true, but that's not why I responded to you. I do love you. And, and, but when you get the Holy Spirit in you, you, you begin to read the Bible. I'm, I'm 53 years old. I've been reading the Bible for, for my entire life. I read through the Bible for the first time when I was, I was a teenager. I, actually, I think I was like 11 or 12 years old when I first read through the entire Bible. And, and I began to create a habit in my life to read through the Bible. And when I was young, like in my 20s, I would try to read five chapters a day. And that was, that was my habit because I wanted to read through the Bible every single year. And so it was this thing that I did. But what happened to me is that if I ever had a day where I didn't read the five chapters, I felt like a failure. I almost felt like I was lost out with God because I hadn't read the five chapters. That's not the will of God. That's not how God wants you to live. God wants you to live victorious. He, he, he knows there's going to be a rough day every now and then. And, but as I got older, I realized that I was just reading the Bible for the sake of being able to say I read through the Bible. That's not the, that's not the idea. The idea is that I would read it so I would know who God is. Not just to be able to say I read it, but actually know the Lord of the book. And, and so I changed my method of the way I read now is I go to the Word of God now with the idea I'm just going to read one chapter. Instead of trying to read five chapters a day, I will just read one chapter. And I have a notepad there, and I take notes on it and ask the Lord, what are you trying to say to me? Because those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. And so even though I've read the Bible so many times, I mean, think about this. How many books have you read that you wanted to go back and read again? And even if there was a book you wanted to read twice, did you want to read it three times? We don't want to. But with the Bible, we want to keep going back to it because through the power of the Holy Spirit, there is this revelation that takes place. And so now I just try to read one chapter a day. Now, some days I actually read two chapters, and then some days I read the entire book. Like, I may sit down, and, and I'm in the middle of 1 Corinthians, and I may read six chapters because the, the Holy Spirit's just dealing with me, and, and there's things that are happening. And, and so that's a whole different way of going to the Word of God. There's something else I want to say about that is this. Don't wait till the end of the day to do your devotion. Like, when I was younger, I was, I'm much... Now I'm a, I'm a middle-of-the-day person. I'm not a morning person or a nighttime person. I really like the middle of the day. Lunchtime. Um, but when I was younger, I, I, I thought I was a night person. You know, I'd stay up all the time. You know, stay up late. You know, I don't even go to bed till midnight. You know? and so I always would save my devotion until later in the, in the evening. But what would happen is I would, I would forget or I'd get busy and I'd get tired. And so as I, I got older, I realized, you know what, if I'll do this in the morning, then, it'll, then I'll make sure I do it before the rest of my day starts stealing everything from me. And so now I always do my devotion in the morning, but here's the other thing I noticed. I was trying to go through all of those days where I could have started my day by filling my tank with the Word of God and with prayer and, and with just devotion in the morning. And, and what changed is so now instead of me going through the entire day by myself, trying to just drag myself through it and get to the end and refuel myself, now I'm just starting the day by reading the Word of God. And there's so many things that are going on and your mind is going th crazy things. One of the reasons that I always keep a notepad with me is because when I get distracted by things that aren't a part of the devotion, I'll write those things down knowing I can come back to it later. But I'm not going to let it distract me from my devotion. And I go ahead and make a note to myself, hey, follow up with so-and-so or, or do this. Don't forget to pay that bill, whatever. And, and, and then I'll get back to my devotion. That's just some practical wisdom for you there. But when you're doing it with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit begins to reveal things to you and teaches you things. And this is what Jesus said in John 14, 26. But when my father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. And so when you and I do this, the Holy Spirit teaches us. I, I, I love how the, the psalmist says that blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. He doesn't walk the way they walk. He doesn't sit the way they sit. He doesn't stand the way they stand. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. And watch what happens. He is like a tree that is planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does he 
prospers. This is, this, th get this in your heart today. The reason Jesus could look at that man who was demon possessed and command that demon to come out is because there's power in the word of God. And when you have the Holy Spirit on your life, it changes things. And I promise you, if you will get the word of God in you and you will allow the Holy Spirit to direct you, you'll be able to see things at home. You'll be able to see things in yourself. You'll be able to see things at work that you couldn't see before. And it will revolutionize the way you live. You'll be driving to work and God will reveal things to you as you're driving to work and you'll, you'll want to pull over and make a note right now. Don't do it while you're driving, but pull over and start making notes because the Holy Spirit's just dealing with you. Okay, you're getting ready to walk into this business and the person that you're having so much of a struggle with, here's why you're struggling with them. And instead of you walking in and you've got your wall up because you don't want to just deal with it, now because you have the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God because you've invested in yourself, now you can walk into that business place with confidence because you know that you have God on your side. He's giving you wisdom, giving you understanding. That's the power of the Word of God. That is the power of the Word of God. And so there's, there's power in the Word of God, but with that comes the necessity of faith and the necessity of the Holy Spirit. But then the, the third and final thing is this, the necessity of teaching the Word of God. Don't just, don't just read the Bible. In some way, you need to be a person who is sharing the Word of God with somebody else all the time. Now, you're going to get asked questions. What about this and what about that? And when you don't know the answer, do me and all of Christianity a favor and don't make up an answer. That happens way too much. A lot of people think there's stuff in the Bible that's not there, and they don't know there's some stuff in there that is. Don't make up an answer. If you don't know the answer, you say, you know what? I, I don't know the answer, but I will find out and get back with you. And if you need my help, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my help. A, a couple weeks ago, somebody called me to ask me a question. They, they, they said, can I put you on speakerphone? I said, sure. And the first thing he said was, they, they told me I can't call my pastor, that, he, that, that you're not allowed to call the pastor and ask him questions like that. And they said, but I told him I could call my pastor. And I'm like, you're absolutely right. When it comes to the Word of God, I want to help you understand the Word of God. I may not be able to give you legal advice or, or tell you how to build a building. I may not be able to do that, but I can help you with the Word of God. And and, and so on some level, you need to be sharing the word of God. And, and when you do this, you need to recognize, 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But those who are being saved, they know it is the very power of God. So the message, talking about God's word, changes. It gives, it gives you power to live. Romans 10.17, so faith comes from hearing. In other words, if there's no hearing, then faith does not come. And hearing through the word of Christ, faith comes from hearing the word of God. Jesus says, John 8, 31, if you abide in my words, you are truly, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Free from what? Free from wrong attitudes. Free from wrong ideas. Free from oppression, free from all kinds of things, just having the word of God and having the, the Holy Spirit in there. And so the apostle Peter wrote it like this, like newborn babies, you need to crave the pure spiritual milk so that you'll be able to grow into full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. And so there's this idea that we need to just be taught the word of God and we need to be teaching the word of God. It is the written word of God. It does not change, but it needs to be shared. And there's power in sharing the word of God. Deuteronomy 6, 7 says, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorpost of your, of your home and of your gates. And so Moses is just telling them, I want you talking about the Bible all day long. It ought to be the breakfast conversation. And it ought to be the lunch conversation. It ought to be the water cooler conversation. And if you've already had your devotion in the morning and somebody's there talking, it may be that God has given you something in your devotion. You may not even know why God gave it to you. And you just wrote it down. And then you're standing at the water cooler at work that day, and somebody starts asking a question. Hey, I'm going through this situation. I wonder what you think about it. And you're just like, well, you know, Paul said in Romans 8, and they're all thinking you're a theologian now. 
but they're interested because the power of the Holy Spirit has spoken to you through his word. And so it ought to be the conversation all the time. Every single one of us ought to be preachers. We can't all be the pastor, but every single one of us can share the word of God. And if we do it through the power of the Holy Spirit, it will change lives. And, and if you're a parent, you need to be talking about the word of God in your, in your home. I have three kids. I'm still raising all three of them. One's 23, one's 20, and, and one's 12. And, and so, uh, yeah, the verdict's still out on whether or not I've done a good job, right? Um, but here's something that Lenita and I have tried to do. Years ago, years ago, when they were real little, I read a book. And in the book, it, it, it showed this study that said that if you want your children to be musicians, um, always have a lot of instruments around the house. Have a piano, have guitars, have horns, have all kinds of instruments around the house. And it will, it will help your kids to gravitate toward that. If you want your children to be well-read, it said always have a lot of books around the house, all kinds of books, just lots of books around the house. And it will cause your children to be well read. And it, and it gave these different things. If you want your kids to be interested in sports, always have a lot of sports stuff around the house. Have the, the basketball, the baseball, have all this stuff around the house. And, and this was a secular book. But in, in my mind, I thought, well, then that means that if I want my kids to be in the word of God, then I should just have a lot of Bibles around the house. And so we've done that. And over the years, we've always bought our children Bibles for the different stages of their life. When they were little, they had little children's Bibles. It's, it's the same word. It's just packaged differently because a little child probably doesn't want to pick up a Thompson chain, right? They want to pick up one that's colorful and, and, and has pictures in it. And, 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 and so we, we, we've tried to do that for them. And, and so all three of my children, on some level, they, they know the Word of God and they have a love for the Word of God. And, and one day, just, this just happened a couple months ago, uh, my 12-year-old came into my office, and, and she asked me, she said, Hey, Dad, will you buy me a new Bible? And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like, yes, absolutely. Now, Elin hears no a lot, okay? She's always coming and asking for something. Hey, Dad, I want a new pair of shoes. No. I want to go to Starbucks. No. I want to, I want to get a manicure. I want to get a pedicure. No, no. And then we even have songs about it. No, 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 no. And we sing that together. She hates that song. She says I should keep my day job. And so I say no to her a lot. But when she asks for a new Bible, I'm going to say yes to that. And she's like, and I'm like, yes. And she said, like, well, good, because I already put it in your Amazon account. <laughs> and so I type into my Amazon account. And I, and I see that she's put this Bible. And I'm going to click purchase. And then I see that she's, she picked out a Bible that costs $50. And my first instinct is to try and talk her into a more economically priced Bible because I can get you a Bible for 15 bucks. In fact, I've got a few right on the shelf right behind me, baby. I can just give you one of those. And, and so I'm looking at this Bible like, why in the world is it $50? And, I, and so I'm looking at it, and it's a Bible that's written for young teenage girls. It's, it's the same Bible. Like, that part's not changed. But it's just set up differently. So it has, like commentary for young teenage girls and instead of it being like a you know a cover for an old man it has a cover that a young teenage girl would would find attractive and so it's the same word of God it's just packaged differently to to for for their benefit and 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 so I I see fifty dollars and it may not be a lot to you but I'm fifty dollars I, I don't want to spend fifty dollars but here's a here's the truth if she had come to me and asked to, that she wanted to be on the on the ball team I'd have gone out and bought her a $300 bat and another $150 glove. And if she wanted to play on the golf team at the high school, I'd go out and buy her a new set of golf clubs, and you'd pay, be paying golf fees and all that kind of stuff. And if she told me that she wanted to get into hunting, I'd go out and buy her a $500 rifle, and, and it would make that happen. And, and if she wanted to, to, to get in, into uh, playing football or, or, or basketball or you know whatever, you know, we, we would do that, right? We do that. We, we get our kids on travel teams and we buy jerseys for them. We, we're doing all kinds of stuff trying to help our kids because we want our kids to be involved in, in sports because we think that their lives are going to be better if we do that. But here's the reality. There is a point zero 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 chance that she's ever going to be in the WNBA. Like no chance whatever that she's ever going to make it to the WNBA and yet, or, or the LPJ or whatever. And yet parents will spend hundreds 
and thousands and tens of thousands of dollars helping their kids to be in a sport where they do not have an opportunity. They will never have a chance to go professional in that sport. And it's a, it's a, it's, it, there's nothing wrong with playing sports. I love sports. I love playing sports all growing up. There's nothing wrong with that. But that is not going to last. And even though there's a 0.0000% chance that she's ever going to be a professional athlete, there is a 100% chance that she's going to spend eternity. She's going to spend eternity in even either heaven or hell. And so whether <laughs> I may not want to drop $300 on a baseball bat, but I will drop $50 on a Bible because I believe in the authority of the Bible. I believe in the power of the Bible. And I believe if my children have the Holy Spirit on their lives and they're reading the word of God, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is right and wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us when we're right. Do not, don't come to the Bible just reading it as a textbook or literature, but ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you, to change you, and to get into it and eat it just as much as you possibly can in the name of Jesus Christ. If you agree with that, stand to your feet. Let's give the Lord a great big hand clap of praise. Let's do that real big. Let's do that real big. Let's do it real big. Let's do it real big. I love it. All of our, our children just, just came in. I love that our children came in. The reason they did is because one of them is getting baptized this morning. Maybe two or three of them. I don't know. But you know, the baptism is in the Word of God. We're obeying the Word of God, and we're teaching our children we obey the Word of God. And so what I want, I want today, what I want so much today is for you to be a person who is in love with Jesus Christ and so much in love with Him that you just want to get His Word inside of you. And when you do it, mix it with faith because faith opens your heart and then allow the Holy Spirit to begin to lead you. And I promise you, you'll begin to share the Word of God in ways that you never dreamed you could. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Our kids are going to be over on this side of the, of the, of the altar and that, that's great. But if you want to come to the altar, if you'd like to come down front for, for prayer for any reason at all, you can come because you want the Holy Spirit. You can come because you want forgiveness. You can come because you want healing in your body. You can come because you want help in your home, help in your marriage. You can come just because you want to worship God. You can come for any reason at all. As I'm praying, if you would like to come to the altar and come down and pray, I invite you to do that. I'm going to be down there, and I'll pray with you. I'll just put my hand on your shoulder. Pastor David Hale will be down there. Janet Guy will be down here. There will be other people down here to, to, to put their hand on your shoulder and just join with you and pray with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Father, thank you so much for your perfect word. I thank you that your word is perfect and it's filled with power. It is, it is a, a word of authority. I thank you for that. My prayer, my hope today is through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we would just receive from you what you have for us, Lord, and we would not, we would not, Lord Jesus, neglect, Lord, what you could do in our lives if we'll just come to your scriptures with faith and with hope, believing that you're speaking to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray in Jesus' name.